I know that if you had the chance, you would have poisoned my coffee. And yet, I drink it. <laughs> and I drink it because I'm mentally healthy and I can tell the difference between reality and paranoid ideation, which is the topic of today's video. Narcissists and psychopaths are paranoid. They are delusional. They don't have full-fledged paranoia or full-fledged paranoid personality disorder, but they are highly paranoid. And as a result of this, and other, <laughs> and other features of narcissism and psychopathy, paranoid ideation destroys intimacy, destroys relationships, because it leads to behaviors which are uh, very problematic, and they are the opposite of intimacy, deprivation, withholding, withdrawal, avoidance, and absence. These are the delectable topics of today's lecture. My name, for those of you who are fortunate, fortunate enough to not know, my name is Sam Vakni. I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, last time I looked. <laughs> and I'm a former visiting professor of psychology and currently a, clinical, a professor of clinical psychology and business management in CIAPS, Cambridge, United Kingdom, Cambridge and Birmingham, United Kingdom. Ontario, Canada, and Lagos, Nigeria. Paranoid ideation is a thought process. It's a form of cognition. It involves persistent suspiciousness and the belief that one is persecuted, harassed, or treated unfairly by others. Now, notice the important, the key features. It's persistent. It involves thinking, it involves suspicion and what we call in psychology conspiracism, the belief that one is the butt or the target of conspiracies. So there's a belief, it's a belief that one is persecuted, harassed or treated unfairly. And because it's a belief, it's an item of faith. Paranoid ideation is the clinical equivalent of a religion. When one is paranoid, it involves anxiety and delusionality. Paranoid ideation is divorced from reality. And because it is divorced from reality, it is not a reaction to real threats in the environment. It is an anxiety reaction. You know the difference between anxiety and fear? You fear realistic, a realistic menace, a threat that is true and factual. You're anxious about imagined, usually, imagined scenarios, you catastrophize, you anticipate. So anxiety is a reaction to internal cognitive processes, while fear is a reaction to environmental cues and information. Similarly, a delusion is a belief that is persistent and immune to information from the outside. It's totally self-contained. And so when you combine anxiety and delusion, and if the delusion is persecutory, if the delusion involves being persecuted, being um, harassed, being the target of conspiracies, and malevolence and malice, being treated unfairly, and, and being abused. If, if you have this conglomerate of reactions to your internal processes, then you suffer from paranoid ideation. But wait a minute, Vaknin, those of you who are still awake say, how can you tell the difference between paranoid ideation, which is a reaction to an imaginary threat or an imaginary conspiracy, in um, a proper reaction to real threats in the environment. In other words, justified paranoia. How, how can you tell the difference? First of all, there's no such thing as justified paranoia. 
all paranoia is delusional and uh, has a foundation of anxiety. So mm, there's no form of paranoia that is real. <laughs> but how can you tell the difference between imagined threats and real threats? Well, we use the in psychology, as we do in law, by the way, in legal studies, we use the reasonable person standard. It's a standard that is used to judge the appropriateness of a person's beliefs when comparing them against the actions or beliefs of a hypothetical reasonable person in the same situation and in the same culture. So we have this ideal person who is hypothetical, but is very reasonable. This kind of reasonable person, of course, is embedded in his own culture or her own culture. They are reactant to cultural mores and, and beliefs and so on and so forth. So, for example, religion, religion is not a delusion because of the cultural background. Because so many people believe in God and angels and what have you, Unfortunately, we cannot diagnose all of them with delusional disorder as we should have done had, had we been strict with the criteria. Culture, the cultural background is very critical. So when you have a paranoid ideation, when you become hyper suspicious, hyper vigilant, when you insist that you are, that there's a conspiracy to take you down, to destroy you, people hate you, People are after you. People are spying on you. People are uh, um, kind of overlooking your accomplishments. People treat you unfairly. You haven't been promoted as you should have been, etc., etc. When you have this set of beliefs about yourself and the environment you're in, in order to determine whether your appraisal of yourself and the environment are realist is realistic, we compare you to a reasonable person. Would a reasonable person have believed the very same things? So if you say that um, there is a cabal of enemies who are spying on you through your refrigerator, it's very likely that most reasonable people would disagree with you. And that would render this perception, render this belief delusional and probably reflective of, an, of some underlying anxiety. Now, paranoid ideation, as I said, involves anxiety and delusion, delusion, but it involves multiple other pathological processes. For example, attribution error. Attribution error is saying, my enemies can't help who they are. This is who they are. They are malevolent. They're malicious. They're vindictive. They're vengeful. They're hateful, and so they're liable to act in a way that would compromise my safety and my even my life, my longevity. So this is attribution error. There's also referential ideation. People go about their business, and you attribute their actions, their choices, to yourself. You say, they've been behaving this way because of me. They've been making these choices because I exist. Everything revolves around me. Whatever they've been doing, they've been doing in order to harm me, to hurt me, to take me down, to vanquish me. So you become the focal point around which everyone else revolves. And this is known as referential ideation. And of course, it's a form of grandiosity. We'll come to it in a minute. Paranoid ideation involves primitive defenses, infantile defenses, defense mechanisms, such as projection and splitting. These psychological defense mechanisms are conducive to paranoia and conspiracism, the tendency to believe in conspiracy theories. Projection is when you attribute to other people elements in yourself that you reject. El attributes of yourself, traits of yourself that you resent, that you hate, and you attribute them to other people. If you are weak, for example, you would say that other people are weak. If you are the one who is vindictive, vengeful, malicious, and malevolent, 
you would tend to attribute these traits to other people. And this is known as projection. Splitting is even worse. Splitting says, I'm all good. Everyone else is all bad. And because they're all bad, they would want to eliminate me, to eradicate me, because I'm a constant reminder of how bad they are. Or because I'm going to stand in their way. Or because they're going to misinterpret my behavior as abusive or whatever. So these infantile defense mechanisms regress, regress you to early childhood when the world essentially was a menacing and hostile place. And the only protection, the only defense was mommy or parental figures. They were known, they're known as secure bases. All these feed into paranoid ideation. And this is exacerbated. When you're focused on winning, on hierarchy, on being, on coming out on top, and when you are suffused with negative effects, fury, envy, hatred, you put all this package together and you're bound or liable to consider everyone around you a potential or actual enemy and to misinterpret their behaviors and choices and decisions and comport and conduct and um, everything they do in light of this assumption that they are your enemies. Paranoid ideation, therefore, has two components. Number one, self-punitive. It is the unconscious belief, belief, I'm a bad person, I'm evil, I did something wrong and I deserve to be punished, and because I deserve to be punished, I will be punished, and I anticipate punishment. This punishment is going to be horrendous and catastrophic, and I need to defend against it, I need to become hypervigilant, I need to be on my toes. So this is one strand of paranoid ideation. And the other type of paranoid ideation is grandiose. I am so important, not maybe generally, but I'm so important to that person or to this group of people that I've become the potential or actual victim of malign intentions and malevolent conspiracies. So there's an element of self-elevation, self-aggrandizement, an element or a delusion of grandeur, a belief that everyone around you revolves around you, that you're the pivot, that you're the axis, that you're the focal point of everyone's intentions and attentions. So there's grandiosity in paranoid ideation. Now, paranoid ideation within relationships, intimate relationships, friendships, even in the workplace, paranoid ideation leads inexorably and always and ineluctably to a series of behaviors which are very, very destructive to the fabric of the relationship. They involve deprivation, withholding, withdrawal, avoidance, and absence. Deprivation is intentional. It's, <clears throat> in a minute, we'll define all this, but it's intentional. It is usually the outcome of withholding. And withholding could be either aggressive, I'm withholding something from you in order to punish you, or it could be aversive, I'm withholding some things, some behaviors, I'm withholding them because I'm afraid of your reaction, or because the whole experience is unpleasant and I have an aversion to it. Withholding. Withdrawal is also either aversive or aggressive. Avoidance, on the other hand, is mostly aversive. We avoid unpleasant people, unpleasant situation, uncomfortable decisions, and so on and so forth. We stay away. This is the pleasure principle. We stay away from anything that is likely to prove unpleasurable. And finally, absence is usually unintentional or aversive. Let's explore all these behaviors, which, as I say, are the outcomes of paranoid ideation, although they could be outcomes of other cognitive processes. Let's start with deprivation. Deprivation is the removal, the denial, or the unavailability of something that is needed or desired. When you deprive someone 
of something they really want or they really need or they really crave or they really desire when you make sure that they have no access no access to this that they want or desire and so on and so forth you condition them so deprivation is usually an element in conditioning a reduction of access to or intake of a reinforcer if you want to use a clinical description when you deprive someone repeatedly on a regular basis that person is conditioned to react in highly specific ways for example to please you now deprivation is not always intentional it could be the outcome of one's personality or one's circumstances in life for example if you're not available mentally and emotionally if you're depressed if you are aggressive by nature if you're narcissistic selfish if you are psychopathic so deprivation would be the outcome of who you are it could be a decision could be the outcome of a decision it could be intentional it could be cruel and even sadistic but very often deprivation is simply who you are you are a depriving person we talk about for example maternal deprivation it's the lack of adequate nurturing for a young child due to the absence or premature loss uh, of a mother figure or a neglect an abandonment by such a mother or a primary caregiver and this affects the individual's early behavioral physical social and emotional development negatively when the mother takes herself out of the equation this has cataclysmic effects on the development of the child and this is known as the dead mother theorem by andre green in 1978 now people keep saying why do you keep, why mother why do you keep blaming mothers what about the father what are, when we say mother or maternal figure or primary caregiver in psychology this has nothing to do with genitalia it has to do with the person could be a man could be a woman could be the father could be the mother could be the grandmother or the grandfather could be a total stranger the person who fulfilled critical psychodynamic and psychological functions in the first 36 months of life that person would be the primary caregiver and shorthand the mother the maternal figure i hope you got that so maternal deprivation usually is the outcome of who the mother is personality wise character wise temperament wise and or circumstances that inhibit the mother and don't allow the mother to function but deprivation is much more common than you than you think whole cultures could be based on deprivation and sometimes we build deprivation into cultural norms and mores and rituals so for example monasteries nuns and monks this whole thing is constructed on deprivation now cultural deprivation is when you don't have the opportunity to participate in the cultural offerings of a society either because you're economically deprived you don't have enough money for example to study in, at a university or a college or because your living standards are low substandard living conditions or because you are discriminated against as a member of a minority or whatever in any case access is denied exactly as you can deny access on the individual level or on the maternal level you can deny and very often we do deny access on the cultural and societal level and this leads to alienation and estrangement a loss of identification with one's culture heritage society um, there's no possibility for assimilation in the dominant culture so when a culture withholds it, withholds itself when it's a dead culture similar to a dead mother we have deprivation now uh, we measure deprivation there's a deprivation index 
It's a measure of the degree or of inadequacy in a child's intellectual environment with respect to such variables as achievement expectations, incentive to, incentive, incentives to explore um, and understand the environment, a provision for general learning, an emphasis on language development and communication, interaction with significant adult, role models, and so on and so forth. This whole, the, all these parameters put together, they yield some kind of deprivation index. The thing is, when you are the captive, the hostage of paranoid ideation, any approach, any intimacy, any interaction with other people is perceived as threatening. And so you withdraw yourself. The paranoid person withdraws avoids, walks away, isolates himself, protects himself in a way that renders access impossible or undesirable. And in this situation, the other person, the intimate partner of the paranoid person, feels deprived, experiences deprivation. Now, deprivation, as I said, involves an avoidance response. An avoidance response is a response in which an organism anticipates an aversive stimulus, something which is unpleasant, something which is threatening, something which should be avoided. And when there's an experience of an aversive stimulus, when there is the anticipation of an aversive stimulus, when there is catastrophizing, when you have scenarios of multiple aversive stimuli attacking you, submerging you, destroying you, in this kind of mental landscape, it's impossible to have any meaningful interaction with other people. Because, for example, sharing information is perceived as a threat. Intimacy is perceived as dangerous access. The paranoid person feels insecure and unsafe all the time. And so they try to prevent contact with the stimulus. But the stimulus, in the case of the paranoid person, is every other person. The avoidance response is a form of abeant behavior. It's also called an avoidance reaction. And abeance, abeance is a response or behavior that results in movement away from a stimulus, either by physical withdrawal from the stimulus or by an action designed to avoid the stimulus entirely, or by mentally absenting yourself from the stimulus, pretending to be there but actually not being there, or in extreme cases, by trying to destroy the stimulus, you. When you're paranoid, everyone is an enemy, and one way is to avoid them, another way is to disconnect, detach, and the third way is to destroy them. And this leads, as we shall see momentarily, to externalized aggression, aggression, and so on and so forth. Most people, healthy people, do not engage in abeyance, but in adience. Adience is a response or behavior that results in movement towards a stimulus because of curiosity, curiosity, because of infatuation, because of a multiple multitude of emotional needs, and so on and so forth. Usually, people are attracted to other people or to social frameworks and environments. They physically approach or they engage in an action that increases contact with the stimulus. But paranoid, people with paranoid ideation, they don't engage in adience, they engage in abeyance. So, and this is very common behavior or set of dysfunctional behaviors in what we call avoidant attachment. Avoidant attachment emerges in very early childhood, actually, during the formative years. And we see uh, children with avoidant, avoidant attachment when they are placed in a strange situation, strange environment with strangers, Children, kids, like two-year-old, and they are just thrown into a world which is unfamiliar to them. 
Now, the overwhelming vast majority of children will run back to mommy. If you take a child, especially a two-year-old child, a three-year-old child, four-year-old child, and you place them in another room, which is unfamiliar and strange and minacious, with strangers, adults that the child doesn't know, is, is not acquainted with, has never had any contact with, this kind of child would run back to mommy, the secure base, would seek safety in mommy's presence. And this is known as secure attachment. But when you place such, when you place a child with avoidant attachment in a strange situation, they do not seek proximity to their mother or parent after separation. Instead, the infant does not appear to be distressed or frightened or terrified by the separation. He actually, the child actually avoids the returning parent. Children with avoidant attachment um, develop later in life into adults with some kind of insecure attachment who are also usually uh, paranoid. They have paranoid ideation and they are hypervigilant on a constant basis. It's very, very common in narcissism and psychopathy. Now, I mentioned insecure attachment and I encourage you to watch the videos on this channel regarding attachment, attachment styles, flat attachment, and so on and so forth. But, and I mentioned that sometimes uh, there are experiments where we place children, very young children, in strange, what is called a strange situation. Strange situation is an experimental technique. We assess the quality of attachment in infants and young children up to the age of two. And the procedure subjects the child to increasing amounts of stress induced by a strange setting, the entrance of an unfamiliar person, and two brief separations from the parent. The reaction of the child to each of these situations is used to evaluate the security or insecurity of their attachment to the parent. Now, a narcissist, especially a narcissist, but to some extent a psychopath, in their minds, they are always in a strange situation because narcissists have impaired reality testing, do not grasp reality appropriately, similar to psychotics. And because psychopaths are unable to conceptualize of other people except as instruments or tools, and the narcissist is unable to perceive the externality and separateness of other people because they don't have these basic tools of coping with human stimuli, with other people. Both narcissists and to a large extent, psycho, to some extent, psychopaths are all the time embedded in a strange situation. Everyone is a stranger. Even in an intimate relationship, everyone is a stranger. The world is hostile out to get you. Things change mysteriously and incomprehensibly. It's like being trapped in a nightmare. It's not lucid dreaming. It's a nightmare that you cannot wake up from. And if you do wake from this nightmare, it's only to find yourself in another nightmare. So they're all the time in a strange situation in their minds as adults. Because as I keep saying, narcissists are very young children. Mentally speaking, emotionally speaking, psychologically speaking, narcissists are children. Very young, I would even say two years old. So they find themselves in these strange situations, but they don't have a maternal figure that they could trust. They don't have a secure base because narcissists have grown up in families which were abusive or trauma traumatizing or instrumentalizing or parentifying or wrong, wrong kinds of families, pseudo-hostile, pseudo-mutual. So they don't have this background of it's okay, it may be a strange situation, but I can run back to mommy, real mommy, or the mommy inside my head. They don't have this. They have no one to run back to, no one to resort to, no safe or secure base. So they become very paranoid. 
very hostile, very aggressive. And all narcissists and psychopaths have an insecure attachment. In the strange situations that they find themselves, they have a pattern of generally negative in inner parent, inner child relationship. It's as if they don't have a secure base, not only out there in reality, but they don't have a secure base internally. They have not introjected, they have not internalized, and they have not incorporated a secure mother. A mother they can trust, a maternal figure they can trust. So they have no respite and no refuge and no sanctuary outside or inside. They need to be on their toes all the time because the world is out to get them and to take them down, to destroy them. Everyone hates them. Everyone conspires against them. They are doomed unless they fight back, unless they're alert unless they spy on others, unless they walk on actions, um, anticipating catastrophe at any minute. This is known as catastrophizing. So, in a strange situations, there's this negative internal relationship between mother and, and parent and child, a process known as identification. It's a maladaptation where the child fails to display confidence when the parent is actually present and sometimes even shows distress um, when the parent is there. It reacts by avoiding the parent when the parent returns, or being ambivalent about the parent, and this continues into adulthood because the narcissist converts his intimate or his or her intimate partners friends into maternal figures the narcissist carries this insecure attachment style into his relationships in superimposes this insecure base approach this i don't trust you this i can't be safe around you he superimposes this attitude on the relationship and then of course naturally he becomes paranoid because if you can't trust someone, if you don't feel safe around someone, it's because you anticipate some malevolent action, some conspiracy against you, some attempt to undermine you and hurt you and punish you in some way. And this carries into adult relationships. We even have a concept known as avoidant marriage. It's a long lasting marriage in which the partners seldom argue because they have agreed to disagree and they accept their differences of opinion with no apparent rancor or emotional investment. They are no longer interested in each other. They're no longer invested in the, in the dyad, in the pair. They are no longer committed to each other. So in couple therapy, one of the first things the therapist observes is whether the couple communicates, even if the communication is negative even if it's fighting. A fighting couple is still emotionally invested in each other. A couple that is quiet all the time, don't exchange a single word, that's a doomed couple. And that's an avoidant marriage or an avoidant diet. And it's an indication because of paranoid ideation, because each of the members of the avoidant marriage, of the avoidant diet, does not trust the good intentions of the other. There is an assumption that the other person is either a potential or an actual enemy or at best indifferent. And so there is avoidance and withdrawal because of anticipated negative outcomes. Avoidance of intimacy is the tendency of some individuals to shun closeness in interpersonal relationships. They regard closeness and intimacy not as promises, not as a wonderful thing, not as an adventure, not as an exploration, but as a threatening landscape. People who avoid intimacy are reluctant and often fearful to become physically or emotionally close to another person. They tend to have superficial relationships and they often report feeling lonely. In attachment theory, 
Avoidance of intimacy is considered the defining characteristic of an avoidant attachment style in adulthood. And there is, in, in the, if this goes too far, for example, if you as a narcissist or a psychopath have been avoiding habitually for decades, and your avoidance is coupled with an ideology or a conspiracy theory that the world is out to get you and that other people are enemies or could be enemies and so on and so forth. If this became who you are, then you developed an avoidant personality. It's a personality that is characterized by feeling uncomfortable when psychologically close to other people. There's a tendency to not form intimate relationships because of the extreme ego, ego dystonic, extreme discomfort of being vulnerable. Intimacy is perceived as a weakness, as a chink in the armor, as a vulnerability, as an, a vector of access. Someone can abuse intimacy, abuse the information, for example, that you share with them to attack you, to destroy you, to undermine you. So better not. Better stay away. Better be alone. Avoidant personality disorder is a personality disorder characterized by hypersensitivity to rejection and criticism and a desire for uncritical acceptance um, in an individual. It is very reminiscent in this sense to narcissism. As narcissists react extremely badly to criticism. Narcissists greatest desire and craving is to be accepted ironically on the other hand it is coupled with an insecure attachment style which is the outcome of really bad experiences with parental figures so this all leads to social withdrawal despite this desire for affection and acceptance and to a fluctuating sense of self-worth self-esteem that goes up and down cycles and self-confidence that is critically dependent on input from the environment that is externally regulated. Now, many, many scholars and thinkers throughout the ages have observed this phenomenon. There's nothing new in anything I've said. Eric Fromm, who was a psychoanalyst and a brilliant, insightful observer of human affairs, mainly in the 1960s, he came up with the concept of withdrawal destructiveness. In the psychoanalysis of Eric Fromm, withdrawal destructiveness is a style of relating to other people based on withdrawal and isolation from others. Destructive behavior directed towards others or a combination of these. Fromm said that this style of relating to other people was motivated by a need to establish an emotional distance arising from a fear of dependency and, and vulnerability. If I'm dependent, if I'm vulnerable, if I'm weak, people will take advantage of it. They will abuse it. They will leverage it to somehow take what's mine or, or destroy me altogether. Anxious avoidant attachment is at the core of this. Uh, and when we see anxious avoidant children, they explore the world only minimally and they tend to avoid or be indifferent to the parent. In adulthood, these people are characterized by a discomfort when they are with other people, uh, a tendency to avoid intimate relationships. The avoidant attachment style is either dismissive or fearful. In the dismissive attachment style, it, there is a positive internal working model of attachment of oneself, characterized by a view of oneself as competent and worthy of love, and a negative internal working model of attachment to others, characterized by one's view that other people are untrustworthy, undependable, dangerous. It's risky. So in the dismissive attachment style, you have a, an inflated view of yourself, a grandiose view of yourself, uh, on the one hand, and coupled with a very negative view of other people, a very devaluing view of other people. Now, the vast majority of narcissists 
actually um, are dismissive, but at the same time, their view of themselves, the, the internal working model of attachment, is compromised by the internalized bad object. The internal working model of attachment is positive. The person perceives himself or herself as competent, lovable, worthy, etc., etc. And with the narcissist, this is the message of the false self. But the false self is false. So, with the narcissist, the internal working model of attachment is positive only on the surface, only when it's public facing. Internally, there is a bad object that has been internalized, a set of voices that keep disparaging the narcissist, undermining the narcissist, doubting the narcissist. And so with the narcissist, there's a highly, there's a unique form of dismissive attachment. On the surface, the narcissist is very positive about himself or herself, very grandiose even. He is perfect. His perfection reified and embodied is godlike. And so all other people are inferior. And because they are inferior, they are likely to envy him. Because people are likely to envy him, the narcissist anticipates rejection, malice, malevolence, conspiracies. People, people envy, the narcissist believes that people envy him and they would want to take him down. This is on the surface. In reality, deep inside, the narcissist perceives himself as a bad object, unworthy, unlovable, a failure, inadequate, and therefore deserving of punishment. The punishment about to be inflicted by others is just desert. The narcissist believes that he deserves it somehow. And he defends against this belief by becoming paranoid. It's, a, it's as if the narcissist says, I'm perfect. Everyone envies, envies my perfection, so they're likely to try to take me down. But actually, I'm deceiving them. I'm not really perfect. I am, in reality, unlovable, inadequate, zero, loser, etc. I'm an imposter. So, their punishment Punishment inflicted on me by others is justified, but it's very painful and hurtful and dangerous, so I should avoid it, and to avoid it, I need to become a paranoid. Individuals with dismissive attachment are presumed to discount the importance of close relationships and to maintain rigid self-sufficiency. So this is very common in psychopathy, where there is no conflict with a bad object. Psychopaths are pure dismissive attachment characters. The narcissist's dismissive attachment is compromised by the bad object. This may lead some narcissists to what is known as fearful attachment. It's The fearful attachment is an attachment style that is, again, insecure and very problematic and very dysfunctional in relationships. And it's a huge problem for intimate partners, for uh, co-workers, for friends, and so on and so forth, because this is an attachment style characterized by a negative internal working model of attachment of oneself, as well as a negative working model of others. And this is much closer to narcissism. Now, I would, I would generalize and say that the narcissist has an unconscious negative view of himself and a conscious negative view of others. While the psychopath has a conscious positive view of himself and a conscious negative view of others. Psychopath, therefore, would have a dismissive style. Another sip from the poison. Psychopath would have a dismissive, dismissive attachment style and a narcissist would have a fearful attachment style. Individuals with fearful attachment doubt internally and unconsciously their own competence and other people's competence, efficacy, lovability, and so on and so forth. And so they don't seek help from other people 
when they are distressed. They don't approach other people. They don't become intimate with other people, etc., etc. This phenomena are observed even in children. And this is where the first year of, years of life are super critical. And that's why all of us in psychology, professionals, scholars in psychology, we focus on the mother or the maternal figure. Whoever fulfills the maternal figure, the maternal role. So these years are critical. It's a fact that we can observe all these behaviors, all these disorders, all these dysfunctions, all these problems in early childhood. We have something called, for example, the withdrawn rejected child. Uh, when we measure peer acceptance, it's a child who displays fearful or anxious behavior and is often perceived by his peers as socially awkward. And such children are at risk for victimization, they're bullied, and so on and so forth. Many of these children develop narcissistic defenses, which later coalesce into full-fledged narcissistic style or even narcissistic personality disorder. Peer rejection is a major engine of narcissism, of the formation of pathological narcissism. It's a compensatory defensive mechanism. That's why children with autism spectrum disorder, children who, are, who have other mental health issues, dyslex, dyslexia, whatever, these children very often become highly narcissistic later in life as adults and at the minimum have narcissistic style, lack of empathy, or de deficient empathy, and so on and so forth, because they're rejected by peers. The withdrawing response in behavioral psychology is any behavior designed to sever contact with a stimulus that is found to be noxious, not to say obnoxious, a stimulus that is really unsettling, ill it is, unpleasant, you want to avoid such a stimulus. It's an escape behavior. It's any response designed to move away from or to eliminate an already present aversive stimulus. Escape behavior could be mental, through fantasy, or daydreaming. It could be behavioral, physical withdrawal from such a stimulus, or a conditioned response, such as when you do something in order to somehow change the stimulus. To, or to terminate it, or you do something symbolically, like in obsession compulsion, so like a ritual. So all these the escape behaviors and, and so on and so forth, in narcissism and psychopathy, the aversive stimulus is other people. The narcissist finds other people aversive because he considers them contemptuously as inferior, and env potentially envious and how to get him and how, how to take him down and how to destroy him. So people are dangerous because of envy, mainly. This is a narcissist, a narcissist mind. It, it, the mediator, the, the, the transmission mechanism is envy. The psychopath has the same mindset. The psychopath believes that other people are out to get him because dog eats dog. You know, it's this is a hostile jungle world. There are no rules, there are no laws. Everyone tries to maximize their 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 benefits and their profits. There, there's no inhibition. Every, everyone is disinhibited given the right circumstances. So psychopaths expect the worst of other people. Narcissists also ex expect the worst from other people because other people are inferior. Psychopaths actually expect the worst from other people because sometimes they assume these people to be their equals. And sometimes they consider other people as natural victims, gullible, stupid. But the psychopath is capable of perceiving other people as his or her equals, while the narcissist is not. And avoidance is a learned, acquired behavior. And there is an avoidance gradient. Avoidance gradient is the variation in the strength of a drive as a function of the organism's proximity to an aversive stimulus. The closer the narcissist gets to you, the more intimate he is with you. So the closer and more intimate the aversive stimulus. The, the narcissist's discomfort mounts and finally explodes in direct proportion to the intimacy. 
Whereas other people fear healthy people, normal people feel more and more comfortable as they become more and more intimate. The narcissist and the psychopath feel less and less comfortable as they become more and more intimate. They are like mirror images of normal healthy people. And this is known as the aversion uh, uh, or, or the avoidance gradient. So withdrawal behavior of the narcissist and psychopath increase, increases in intensity as they get nearer to the person, as they become more dependent on the person, even as they derive pleasure from another person and they become dependent on this pleasure. Narcissists and psychopaths push people away, push them away, hurt them, damage them, ruin them, simply as a recoil mechanism, as don't get too close to me, stay away. It's dangerous. Your knowledge of me, your intimacy with me, the, the fact that I crave your presence, that I love you, it's, this is uh, bad. This is a weakness. This is a vulnerability. I need to stay away because it's going to hurt me. Narcissists, of course, and many psychopaths learn to associate positive emotions such as love with inevitable outcomes of pain and hurt, having been, having been, having been traumatized, abused and rejected and abandoned by maternal figures. So love triggers in them the anticipation of hurt pain and self-destruction. So the avoidance, the avoidance gradient is, of course, the opposite of the approach gradient. The variation in the strength of a driver is a function of the organism's proximity to its stimulus or goal or pleasure. Healthy, normal people, they aspire aspire to proximity and to intimacy uh, with another person who is helpful, pleasurable, fulfills some goals, meets some expectations, they aspire for an ever closer union with such a person. Of course, up to a point. Beyond a certain point, we are talking about pathological merger and fusion, a symbiosis, which is common in narcissism. So, Narcissists have problems with the approach gradient and with the avoidance gradient because they misidentify, misidentify, stimuli, in other words, they misidentify the presence of other people and what other people can bring to the relationship as threats. Relationships are perceived as threats. And yet, this narcissist is driven to have relationships and intimacy. And fantasy, and because of his need to reenact early childhood conflicts, I recommend that you watch the shared fantasy playlist on this channel. Avoidance is dysfunctional. Avoidance is problematic. Avoidance is painful because it's frustrating. If you crave someone, if you love someone, if you desire someone, if you are dependent on someone, and then by your own design, you can't approach them, you have to avoid them, you're compelled, it's a compulsion, you can't help it, it's frustrating. It's frustrating, it, it produces a lot of anger and aggression, a lot of it self-directed. You hate yourself for being like that. And you develop avoiding, avoidance coping strategies. These are strategies for managing stressful situations in which a person does not address a problem directly, but instead disengages from the situation and averts attention from it. So the narcissist would tend to deny his dependence on other people. He would tend to deny his need for intimacy, his cravings for love and affection <clears throat> and compassion and empathy. He would tend to deny all this. He would present himself as godlike and therefore self-sufficient, self-contained, Narcissists even self-supply when they can't obtain narcissistic supply from other people. They develop these mechanisms of being able to solipsistically exist as the only object in the universe. They don't recognize the externality and separateness of other people. Other people don't exist except as figments 
internal objects in their imagination, in the mind and imagination of the narcissist. So, narcissists deny the frustration and the pain of avoidance by pretending to be everything they need. I don't need anyone. I have everything inside my mind that I would ever need. I can survive on, a, on an island all by myself, even without Friday. The individual turns away from the processing of threatening information. So escape, escapism is an example of such avoidance uh, strategy. Wishful thinking, self-isolation, constricted life, undue emotional restraint, some forms of introversion, and using drugs or alcohol. Um, avoidance coping strategies are very self-sabotaging because they are self-perpetuating. It's a vicious circle. cycle. The more you are into avoidance strategies, the more comfortable you feel in the avoidance space. And it prevents uh, using approach coping strategies. Avoidance strategies reduce stress and anxiety. They are anxiolytic. They prevent uh, emotional dysregulation and mood lability. In emotional dysregulation, the individual is overwhelmed by negative, usually negative, but not only, by emotions, overwhelmed by emotions. Avoidance coping strategies are intended to prevent this. And Susan Roth was the first to describe the connection between regulation, internal regulation and avoidance strategies in 1986. Um, she wrote about personality psychology um, involving avoidance coping strategies. Lawrence Cohen was another psychologist who has written extensively on these issues. Avoidance behavior is any act or series of actions that enables an individual to avoid or to anticipate unpleasant or painful situations, especially with other people. Stimuli, events, circumstances, environments that pose the potential for threat, danger, risk, criticism, mortification, narcissistic injury, aggression. Narcissist avoids all these. And the only way to avoid all these, this panoply of typically human interactions, is by avoiding human humans altogether. And this leads to avoidance conditioning, self-administered avoidance conditioning, the establishment of behaviors that prevent or postpone aversive stimulation. The narcissist says, if I go there, I'm going to be criticized, exposed, humiliated, and shamed. I'm not going to go there. If I engage in an intimate relationships, I'm going to be vulnerable, and my, my partner would use it against me in due time. If I become a friend with someone, they're going to take advantage of me and exploit me. Everyone is envious of me, and so my boss is going to demote me or not promote me, and so on and so forth. Better avoid all this. Better avoid people altogether. Stay at home. Work from home. I'm self-sufficient. I don't need anyone. I'm happy with my own company. So this is known as avoidance conditioning. Gradually, the person self-conditions and becomes used to avoidance as an automatic reflexive reaction. When never confronted with a situation involving another person, the avoidance conditioning will kick in and the person will avoid somehow. Sometimes by sabotaging the situation, undermining, being passive aggressive. Avoidance is the practice or instance of keeping away from particular situations, environments, individuals, or things because of an anticipated negative consequence of such encounters or an anxious painful feeling associated with such uh, interactions. Now we don't, I, co I connected in this lecture, avoidance to paranoid ideation. There are other theoretical perspectives. Uh, some, some psychologists think that avoidance is a means of coping, as I mentioned, that it is anxiolytic, reduces stress, prevents overwhel being overwhelmed by emotions. Some, some believe that avoidance is a response to fear and innate shame. 
which is also my view when it comes to narcissism. Narcissism is a reaction to shame, compensatory reaction to shame. And when you're triggered by other people in situations and environments, the, this could lead to the re-emergence or re-eruption of the shame, a process known as narcissistic mortification. Some psychologists believe that avoidance is a personality style or predisposition, maybe even genetic predisposition. And some believe that it is merely a component in anxiety disorders. What is very clear is that people need to approach and only some people then need to avoid. Everyone needs to approach, even psychopaths, even narcissists, even psychotics. Human contact is built into the hardware and the software of who, who we are. So approach is universal. Avoidance is not. We have approach avoidance repetition compulsions, first described by who else? Sigmund Freud, where people approach because they crave intimacy or they seek external regulation, and then they're terrified by the intimacy and the engulfment and the being consumed and they feel suffocated and they run away. This is typical of borderlines, people with borderline personality disorder or borderline personality organization. But approach avoidance conflicts are pretty common because it's very difficult for us to calibrate, to, to get it right. Sometimes intimacy is too much. Sometimes we are being too detached and cold and distanced. Sometimes we try to compensate or overcompensate. I mean, we never get it right. It's always a, a work in progress. And when we talk about a, a approach avoidance conflict, it's a situation that involves a single goal or, or, or option that has both desirable and undesirable aspects or consequences. So in this sense, these conflicts, these repetition compulsions, are forms of dissonance. And because avoidance is a cognitive function, we're talking about cognitive dissonance. The closer an individual comes to the goal, to the desired person, to the circumstances or environment that he was seeking, the closer the accomplishment is, the greater the anxiety. Because everything, people, events, places, circumstances, environments, goals, accomplishments, everything is negative and positive elements, traits, attributes. You can't get only the positive without the negative. And this creates sometimes the tendency to run away, to push people away, to avoid, to withdraw, in order to um, avoid the negative aspects of the situation. But then when you avoid the negative aspects, by distancing yourself, by pushing people away, by withdrawing, by avoiding, this increases the desire and the craving and the wish. So it's an endless loop, a conflict, an inner conflict, a compulsion. Approach, avoid, avoid, approach. This is a classical thing. It's been described in literature for well over 120 years. But there are other types of conflicts. For example, approach-approach conflict. It's a situation involving a choice between two equally desirable but incompatible alternatives. I want to do A and I want to do B, but they're incompatible. They're mutually exclusive. If I do A, I will destroy B. If I do B, I will destroy A. If I have a lover, I will lose my marriage, for example. That's an approach-approach conflict, a double approach conflict. We have an avoidance-avoidance conflict as well. It's a situation involving a choice between two equally undesirable, objectionable alternatives. For example, when you must choose between unemployment or a cut in your salary. <laughs> That's um, a double avoidance conflict. And then there is a double approach avoidance conflict. It's a complex conflict situation arising when a person is confronted with two goals or options that each have a significant attractive and a significant unattractive feature. So you see, this is much more complex than, than we think. Approach and avoidance are coping strategies. With a narcissist, though, avoidance has overwhelmed approach. 
and thus is his sacrifices, his wishes, desires, dreams, hopes, and his shared fantasies. Sacrifices everything, closeness, proximity, intimacy, love, love received. Sacrifices everything just to avoid the inevitable in his mind, the inevitable, painful, hurtful, mortification or injury or rejection or abandonment. And this is typical of borderlines as well. We live in a civilization that is highly narcissistic, highly borderline and increasingly more psychopathic. So it's not a surprise that we are developing a culture and a society that reflects avoidant dynamics and absence. It's a norm that norm of entitlement that I will do the minimum. I will do the minimum and take the maximum. I will avoid life and other people and situations and circumstances, environments and challenges and even goals because avoidance has its own value, is a goal in itself. I will strive to become self-sufficient, minimize my interaction surface with other people, do the minimum in my job, it has a name, I forgot, do the minimum in my job, and so this is an, a culture of absence, a culture of avoidance, and absenteeism is becoming more and more common, truancy, absenteeism, and so on and so forth, and it's no longer linked to job satisfaction, organizational culture, or even the culture of absence. It's, a, it's become normative as a coping strategy. And so we introduce the absenting of ourselves as a way to cope with all challenges. We absent ourselves. So we even have a, a new phenomenon which is known as absent grief. It's a form of complicated grief in which a person shows no or only few signs of distress about the death of a loved one. And this pattern of grief is an impaired response resulting from denial or avoidance of emotional realities, the emotional reality of the loss, first and foremost. Absent-mindedness is another form of avoid avoidance and withdrawal, although absent-mindedness is also a form of passive aggression. It's a state of apparent inattention, marked by a tendency to be preoccupied with one's own thoughts and not with external conditions or demands. But as I said, there's a lot of passive aggression here. Covert narcissists are usually absent-minded. Mind-wandering, it's a condition where thoughts do not remain focused on the task at hand, but they range widely and spontaneously across other topics. It's not attention deficit. It's much more complicated than that. It's a rejection of the outside world and its requirements and its expectations. I will do what I want. I will focus on my internal world and my day dreams and my thoughts and my fantasies. Uh, this kind of uh, attention, attentive aggression or attentional aggression is becoming more and more common and it's a major becoming a major strategy uh, of avoidance and withdrawal, which is ostensibly and ostentatiously justified by technology. So the incidence of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in children and adults is exploding exponentially. And there's a linkage to technology. Technology made me like that. But of course, it's not. I link it not to technology but to the rise in narcissism, to be absent-minded, to allow your mind to wander when you talk to another person or when you interact with another person, is simply put, aggression. It's a form of aggression. It's passive aggression, but it's aggression all the same. I try to give you an overview um, of of the ways in which narcissists and psychopaths 
avoid potential risks and dangers in the environment by avoiding the environment altogether, especially human environment. And this leads to extreme dysfunctions in relationships, dysfunctions which I mentioned. It is linked in the case of the narcissist, actually, to early childhood pain and hurt when the narcissist tried as a kid, as an infant, to experience and express positive emotions. To the internalization of a bad object, a constellation of voices and introjects that inform the narcissist how unworthy, inadequate and unlovable he is, and the desperate attempt to compensate for all this by presenting a false facade, by becoming an imposter in effect. And then the anticipation of exposure and pain and hurt and injury, humiliation, shame and mortification. And this anticipation leads to hypervigilance and to paranoid ideation. Paranoid ideation leads to putting distance, pushing people away, withdrawing and avoiding the schizoid defenses of the narcissist. The psychopath, the situation is a lot simpler. The psychopath avoids other people as a form of projection. He, know, he attributes to other people his own lack of empathy, ruthlessness, callousness, envy, hatred, and externalized aggression. He fully anticipates other people, the psychopath fully anticipates that other people will treat him the way he wishes to treat them, or the way he treats them. And then, of course, it's very frightening and dangerous, and he keeps away. Psychopaths, as I keep saying, are much healthier than narcissists, mentally speaking, psychologically speaking. And they're much closer to healthy and normal human beings. They're socially problematic, shall we say, but they are much more recognizable as human beings, exaggerated human beings, if you wish. Narcissism, on the other hand, is such a convoluted, distorted, malformed and mutilated inner landscape, lack of self and ego, no coordination, kaleidoscopic change that is unpredictable, that narcissism presents a much, much bigger um, therapeutic challenge than psychopathy. Psychopathy, there is a big debate whether it's a mental illness to start with or a mental disorder to start with and whether therapy is relevant at all. Psychopathy looks more like a choice or personality style or a character or a temperament. While narcissism clearly is a severe, extremely severe mental illness and we have just scraped the tip of the iceberg in the last hundred and something years. I believe that narcissism will unravel the core of mental illness, all mental illness. Narcissism is at the core of all mental illness. I've been saying it for 30 years now. And avoidance and withdrawal, are what, this, these are two examples of the way narcissism informs the narcissist's behaviors to render them utterly uh, dysfunctional and all the opposite of self-efficacious.